Another one of the effects of digitalization is what people call crowdsourcing. That means that you source your resources from the crowd, from the decentralized the public. The sharing economy this is another term that people use that arises from this logic. So, so what is that about? For example, there are some applications like the Amazon Mechanical Turk, where millions of people offer their free time to execute some very short or mundane tasks, sometimes they're even more sophisticated. But for example, many of my colleagues in academia use this service to answer a survey. So they just ask people questions and they answer the survey and for every answer they get a couple of cents. Or you can use it to train a machine learning algorithm. Imagine you have an algorithm that recognizes colors. So you have to train the machine. So you tell people, well, correct the machine. Is this red or orange? And with this, the machine will learn. You give them a couple of cents for every time they do a task. They can be more sophisticated, but usually these are these micro tasks that, that you get through this, through this, that you offer through these services. There are some other platforms where millions of people offer their services and their skills as micro entrepreneur. For example, here, more than 8 million micro entrepreneur offer the services and over 100 80 countries, almost a billion dollar uh, of revenue is turned around in these in these platforms. So for example, if you are an artist and you're very good at drawing, you can offer your services to draw postcards for people, individualized postcards, um, or you're good at sewing or whatever, whatever service you have. Uh, so this the, the result is this economy where micro entrepreneurs are able to share their skills. What are some of the characteristics of digitalization that lead to that? Well, obviously there are many involved, but two obvious ones are polydirectionality. The fact that you can communicate one to many means I offer my services as somebody who has the skill of knowing how to draw. Then I can have a one-to-one -one communication negotiating about the conditions of the contract. Then there is a many-to-one feedback. Many people like my services. They give me likes. So I rise to fame in this in this platform and many to many communication. Another one is the death of distance. So if you want to have somebody drawn a personalized postcard or poster, you can contract somebody who is on the other side of the globe. But it doesn't really matter. Uh, the death of distance is very important to really to draw these resources together in this crowdsourcing uh, efforts. One platform that made a lot of splash is called Kaggle. Kaggle. Of Kegel, uh, which is a platform where people offer their services to make predictions based on databases that you give them. Have a look at this little video that explains a little bit more about how, how this platform works. Two very famous examples of Kegel were that Netflix, the movie, uh, service uh, offered a million dollars to somebody who could improve their prediction algorithms of who would like which kind of movies. And in 2007, 8, and 2009, in three consecutive years, they were able to improve their prediction algorithms significantly uh, with the result that at the end, three quarters of the orders that are movie orders that are made through Netflix are actually the result of predictive algorithms that give you suggestion, well, you watch this kind of movie, you watch this kind of movie, you might also like this kind of movie. So people got together and created these teams in order to pr improve this algorithm. And Netflix used the platform Kegel. Uh, NASA as well. Uh, you might think they have the best and the brightest scientists, but they had a problem with measuring the shape of galaxies. So they offered this competition uh, in public. And a PhD student in glacier mapping outperformed NASA's best algorithm in just the first week. So that's the power of crowdsourcing. You, you really get your resources from the decentralized crowd. The logic of crowdsourcing of, of platforms where people can share their skills, sometimes called the sharing economy, has created entire industries, huge industry. One example that 
you might be very aware of is the so-called app economy. The fact that on our mobile phones nowadays, everybody can produce an app and offer it for download for a dollar or two dollars. And in the first five years of this app economy, it is estimated that it had a revenue of $75 billion. $75 billion sold through these one, two, three, five dollar apps that you download. $75 billion, that's more than the size of two thirds of the world economies. That means two thirds of the world countries are smaller than this virtual economy just based on, on, on selling apps that shows you the power of this crowdsourcing logic. Now, back to the big picture of creative destruction, creating such big virtual new kind of economies also creates uh, a lot of challenges in the social, cultural, political, institutional realm. For example, let's go back to Colota Perez, who told us, well, first of all, if you want to have a paradigm shift, you also need the development of surrounding services that support the rise of this new paradigm. So, for example, one surrounding service that has arisen with this app economy is, as you can see here, this woman is employed with a couple of dozen or a hundred mobile phones and all she is paid to do all day long is to download an app, to like it, then to delete it, to download the app again and to like it, then to delete it. Why would somebody pay her for doing that? Well, the statistics of how often this app is downloaded therefore go up. And there are much more concrete things. For example, here you can see for four dollars you can buy yourself a thousand five hundred views on your YouTube videos. For twelve dollars at this offer, you can buy yourself a thousand followers on Twitter or a thousand downloads of a song that you have on a music app, which then, of course, I mean, you buy a couple of thousands of them. People think like, wow, that's a really great song. It has already 10,000 downloads and you get a lot of visibility. So they are kind of like surrounding services that are well, are they really working in the sense that we want them to work? But Colonia Perez tells us, well, there has to be a cultural adoption of the logic of these interconnected technologies involved. Another example that was very contentious is the uh, ride-sharing service Uber, which basically replaced a lot of taxi services. Uh, some cities went very aggressively against them, trying to prohibit that Uber is entering in their city. Other cities completely adjusted the way the taxis now drive. They develop their own apps. Summing it all up, what Claude Perez tells us, we also need to create these institutional facilitators. So for example, we might want to create institutional facilitators that make it more difficult to cheat and some other institutional facilitators that help us to really embrace this new way, these new resources, because the sharing economy comes with a lot of benefits for the people, for the provider of these services, but also for the consumers. But we also have to make sure that institutions are in place. And taxi drivers, for example, say, well, we need to pay a license. We have to have a first aid license as well. We have to know different emergency procedures. And if you're an Uber driver, you don't have to. So, well, the two things we can do, either we also don't ask it from taxi drivers, Oh, and or we, we find it. So every city now is also struggling with uh, really embracing that. And that's what Calota Paris means with the need to create this institutional facilitator that allows us to socially construct the kind of digital reality that we want to have.